morning, everyone. Good to be with you again as we continue our study in the book of Mark. We're in chapter 8, and we'll be picking up in uh, verse 10 this morning. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, as always, we come before you humbly, asking you to bless our study in the Gospel of Mark as we... Uh, near the halfway point, Father, and we're getting to the crux of the matter of what it takes to become a disciple. Eighth chapter is a very pivotal part of that, Father, and we, we pray that as we study through it, that you'll be with us and guide us, give us wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we ask your prayers upon the Lake Homa Church, all of its members, and all of those who uh, watch the broadcast of this lesson, Father. Uh, I look forward to the time when we can uh, do it together in a more personal way. But Father, we, we are blessed to be able to still study together as we are today. Father, we, uh, we ask you to forgive us of our wrongs. We ask you to help us to be better servants of yours, to be used as instruments of your righteousness. And we're so thankful, Father, that we have your Son as our Savior. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so last week we saw uh, the second accounting, the second time that Jesus has fed a very large group of people, this time 4,000. And again, he's done it in a miraculous way, uh, taking uh, seven loaves and creating enough bread and enough fish to... to uh, feed this large crowd. And uh, as I've said before, uh, that would have been a, a marvelous thing to be able to observe creation. So that's what makes these particular uh, miracles unique. Today we're going to be picking up in uh, verse 10 of the chapter. And let's begin by reading down through verse 13, Mark chapter 8, verse 10. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. So Mark says that they sailed to the district of Dalmanutha. If we look at Matthew's account of this same uh, activity, and again, we'll be at the end of the 15th chapter of Matthew and the first part of the 16th chapter, and we'll be referring back uh, to that a few times if you want to keep that marked as well. But in Matthew 15 and 39, after uh, sending away the people whom he had just fed miraculously, it says that he got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. So Mark says Dalmanutha, Matthew says Magadan. Is there some kind of discrepancy here? Well, no, I don't believe there are any discrepancies in the Bible. These were two small villages that don't exist anymore, and it's hard to find evidence of exactly where they were. I do think they were on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, because uh, later on, when we get uh, a little further down, we're going to see that when they cross back again to the other side of the lake, they're near Bethsaida on the uh, east side of the lake. So we can narrow it down uh, to uh, that western side. Uh, some people think that uh, what uh, the term that uh, Matthew used, Magadan, and the, the village that we know was over there of Magdala, that those could be the same ones because the, uh, uh, between the Aramaic and the Hebrew, you often got your N's and your L's uh, tr uh, mixed up. One, be one would call it one way and one the other. So that's a possibility. But when, when places are small and they don't exist anymore, it's pretty hard to narrow it down exactly. And it's not important because I think we can get it down 
to that relatively small area around uh, Magdala. So we're on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, and wherever this was, the Pharisees are able to find them. So it's not, not uncharted territory, it's right there in, in the midst of other places that Jesus has been before. And remember about the Pharisees, they've already decided that Jesus isn't the Messiah. And they've already decided that they want to kill him. And of course, why was this? Well, Jesus just did not measure up to the type of Messiah that they were expecting. They expected a rich, powerful, magnetic type personality who was going to be able to draw all the people to him, raise a large army, be able to defeat the Romans, and make Jerusalem the capital of the world. That's the way they had interpreted the Old Testament scriptures, which of course is very far from the truth. But they, they did not like this itinerant carpenter. Uh, all they could see him doing was causing problems with the plans that they already had laid out. So they are always questioning him. They're always trying in some way to prove that Jesus is a fraud. So they ask him for some great sign from heaven to prove who he is and who he says he is. So uh, this would not be the normal healing that he, they're not asking him to do more healings. They're not asking him to cast out more demons. What they want is lightning and thunder from heaven. Uh, they want some magnificent expression of his power. Uh, they want maybe causing the sun or moon to stop in their tracks, as was done in the Old Testament. Maybe even a raining manna from heaven. That might have been something that would have satisfied them. I don't know. They, of course, couldn't deny the miracles that he's already done. Uh, so they wanted to be able to say that there were some miracles which he could not do. So they were always challenging him to do something spectacular. Again, if we look at Matthew's account, uh, starting in the 16th chapter, it says the Pharisees and Sadducees came up testing him and asked to him to show a sign from heaven. So they, they want something really spectacular. Uh, and, and this is, there's something else big here in this first verse of Matthew 16 because it shows that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were actually working together at this point. Now, you're just not going to find that anywhere else in the scriptures where they were working so closely together on a common goal. They did not like each other. Uh, the Pharisees made up the majority of the Sanhedrin, but the high priest and his family came from the Sadducees and they had all the important positions uh, so while they were not in the plurality, they had a lot of power because of their wealth and their high position. So this is a, the first and only time that we see them mentioned as acting uh, against Jesus together because they really hated each other. Uh, they just didn't work together on anything. But they are in agreement that Jesus is not the Messiah and that he needs to be done away with. They are very much in agreement on that. So Jesus, of course, was doing miracles every day, uh, things which should have proven without a doubt that he was the Messiah, but they wanted more. They weren't satisfied with that. Matthew does add a little more to the account, embellishes a little bit on what Mark tells us. So in Matthew 16 and verse 4, he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So do you think uh, that they would have any idea at that time of what he meant by the sign of Jonah? No, uh, I, don't, I don't think they understood that at all, as they often uh, misunderstood what Jesus was saying. They, they didn't understand his parables, and uh, they really were uh, at a loss as to what Jesus might have meant by this. 
Jesus never gave signs on demand, did he? You couldn't come up to Jesus and, and ask for something uh, specially spectacular to be done. Bring him a sick person, yes. Uh, bring him a demon-possessed person, yes. He would have compassion on them. He would not heal them or cast out the demon uh, in a frivolous way. He did it out of compassion. He didn't do it as, as uh, someone who was playing to a crowd. Have you ever been tempted to say, God, just give me a sign? This is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees are doing. And I think a lot of times in our own lives, uh, when we're especially consternated by a particular problem, uh, it's tempting to say, God, j just show me the way, just, just give me a sign. But that's not really the way that, that we are to approach our Lord. And Jesus won't play their game. What does he do? He just gets back into the boat and leaves. Uh, Jesus liked to practice social distancing when it came to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, didn't he? He didn't like to uh, have to be around them any more than he had to. So in verse 14, uh, we take up another matter that again involves some bread. Jesus, of course, in our lesson last week had, had created bread to feed the crowd. And there's another discussion about bread and leavening that begins in verse 14 of chapter 8. So let's read that down through verse 21. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss with, them, with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of pieces you picked up? And they said to him, 12. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not understand? How, how silly it is for the disciples to be rowing back across to the east side of the lake around Bethsaida. How silly it, is it for them to be arguing that they didn't bring enough bread with them uh, to satisfy their hunger on this row or sail across the lake when they'd seen Jesus do these two great miracles of creating bread. So, I think probably the discourse that Jesus had with the Pharisees had probably been very uh, upsetting uh, to the disciples. Uh, they're in an unsettled situation. Uh, they're, they're still maybe not used to such uh, disagreement and, and such harsh language back and forth between Jesus and the Pharisees. And it's probably uh, in their haste to leave when Jesus Jesus wanted to get away from the Pharisees, and so I think this happened very quickly, that they jumped in the boat and they sailed away, and, and it would be a pretty normal thing for them to have forgotten to obtain enough food for the trip. So they find this one loaf of bread between them, and Jesus is trying to use this occasion, as I'm sure you have seen, to give them an analogy uh, pertaining to their enemies and how effective their enemies can be if they're not careful. Uh, leaven is used many times in the scriptures, isn't it? And most of the time, it's used to describe some type of evil influence uh, mixed in with the truth. Matthew tells us exactly what the leaven represents. If we go back to that 16th chapter of Matthew again, look at verses 11 and 12. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? 
but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So they do finally get it after a while. And what about this leaven that Jesus is talking about, this leaven of the Pharisees? It's corrupt religious teaching. Uh, we've already talked about that a great deal, how the Pharisees uh, came up with their own stuff to replace God's law with, their own teachings and rulings, which they had written down over the years and which they now uh, let supersede the true teachings that God had written down for them. And then also it's interesting that we see here mentioned also in verse 15, he talks about the leaven of Herod as well as the leaven of the Pharisees. What do you suppose that would be referring to? Well, who was Herod to them? He was the uh, Roman governor of part of their land. So he was the chief, one of the chief politicians in that area. So the leaven of Herod, I think, would probably refer to the uh, corrupt politics that are going on in their country as well today. I, I'm sure glad that we don't have to worry about that today, aren't you? Corrupt politics. The great danger, I think, in the kind of leaven that Jesus is talking about is that when it's mixed with just enough truth, then it can be a very deceptive poison. And it makes it very hard to detect. Anytime uh, someone has ever tried to introduce uh, that which is against the teaching of God, those who are most effective at it would mix it with just enough truth of the gospel to confuse people, to try to get their point across. And so I think it's, uh, it's still a problem that's uh, very prevalent today, uh, both in our worship and in the doctrines that we use. We try to keep those doctrines pure and from the, and, and from the Bible only. But it's so easy uh, when we think we can do things better than God to try to mix our own uh, desires, our own ideas, the way things we can make things better and mix them with, with what God has said and cause great confusion in the church. It's very rare that false doctrines are blatantly introduced. So they're usually introduced in the way that they're mixed with the truth in almost every case. It clouds it and it certainly makes the, di the issue more difficult uh, to uh, work with or to see what, a, what the right thing to do is. How much of a point has Jesus been able to make with the disciples as we get down to verse 16? So at first, they seem to think that Jesus is just scolding them for forgetting to bring enough bread for the trip. If you will excuse the pun, do you think Jesus was getting just a little fed up with their reaction? Why are they so worried about not having enough bread when they have been witness two times to him creating enough bread to feed at first time 5,000 and the second time 4,000? And they certainly at this point did not yet understand what he was saying about the Pharisees and Herod. One of the things I would most not want to hear Jesus say about me is that I had a hardened heart. And that's what he intimates in verse 17. He asked that question, do you have a hardened heart? Wow, I would not want to hear those words directed at me from the lips of our Savior. Now in this context, the term hardened heart means a dull or insensible heart. They just had a hard time getting the lessons. And this has been about two years that they've been going around with Jesus now. We're two thirds of the way uh, through his ministry and they still are dull and insensitive about a lot of things. Uh, it's kind of like you say, well, you, that guy's so hard headed, you can't teach him anything. 
And a lot of times the disciples collectively are a lot like that. What had they learned from the many great miracles that they had seen him perform? Uh, what knowledge had they obtained from the many lessons that they had heard him teach? Jesus in verse 18 is telling them, can't you remember anything that you've seen and heard these last two years? Jesus uh, reminds them as we finish up this paragraph of what they have seen him do. He mentions the things in verse 19 and 20 which uh, they were very recently aware of. So they're showing a dullness of spirit. They're showing a lack of faith. And we never do that, do we? Right? That's never a problem that we have. So uh, I'm glad we never do that, aren't you? And then in verse 21, we know from here and from Matthew's account that we previously read that they finally did get it. It took a while, it took some scolding, it took some pointed questions, but they finally do get the point. Uh, they're just like we are. The first thing they thought of instead of what Jesus actually meant were their physical needs, their worldly needs. And, and that's just like us. That's what we're guilty of as well. We're, we're concerned more about the physical needs of this world many times than we are with what's spiritual. And Jesus was certain, certainly trying to show them a, a spiritual implication from what is being said here. Okay, so he's going, they're going to sail now. They've, they've, they've finished their uh, trip back across the other side of the lake. So we're going to uh, finish up this morning by looking at the next paragraph beginning in verse 22 and uh, continuing down through verse 26. Let's read that. And they came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and entreated him to touch him. And taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands upon him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I am seeing them like trees walking about. Then again he laid his hands upon his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored, and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Uh, so here they're back at Bethsaida. It's on the northeast shore of the Lake of Galilee. It's uh, just about at the point where the Jordan River enters that lake. And this blind man is brought to him, and evidently uh, he has not been blind from birth. Did you pick up on that as we read? Look at verse 24 in particular, because it tells us that he knew what trees and men should actually look like as he's beginning to see again. Again, we note that the man and his friends did have faith. And that always seems to be a pretty intricate part of what Jesus is looking for as he heals individuals. Uh, again, we do not know why Jesus brings him out of the village. Uh, was it to get away from the Pharisees who perhaps were waiting for him there? Or not to have so many curiosity seekers around? because this seems to be some of his motivation in the past for wanting to get away from the crowds. And just like in the previous chapter, when he healed a deaf man and a man with a speech impediment, notice that he uses his saliva, just like he did in that case. And at first application, notice that it says the man sees indistinctly. Uh, he can only uh, see outlines of individuals walking. He describes them as trees walking about. And then after a second touch from Jesus, his sight is completely restored. Why do you suppose in this particular instance Jesus uses a two-step procedure? 
I don't know. And neither does anyone else. Maybe he liked variety. Showing that he could heal in progressive steps or instantaneously. Showing that he could heal from very near or, in a, as in other instances, very far away. That he could heal by touching or not touching. Uh, I certainly don't believe that it was any uh, failure on Jesus' part that the first touching didn't get the job done. No, I think from the very moment that Jesus set out to heal this man, he knew exactly how he was going to do it in this two-step way. I think Jesus has probably been trying to maintain some privacy at this point. A lot of the times that he goes away suddenly and unexpectedly is so that other people can't maybe figure out where he's going. We've seen this already several times in trying to find uh, places that are private and where he can do some more special teaching for his disciples. But it's interesting as we close about uh, what he tells the man. If the man goes back into the town, Bethsaida or whatever small village is around there, and he tells uh, everyone what has happened to him, of course what's going to happen? A large crowd is going to come out and a large crowd uh, hampers Jesus in many of the things that he would like to do. There are times when he wants to teach to large crowds. We've seen that, but there are also many times when he wants small group study and uh, wants to be more alone. Uh, he apparently doesn't want that large crowd at this time. And thus, he tells the man, do not even enter the village. Now, we're going to stop there for this lesson. And uh, we'll pick up in verse 27 of chapter 8 next time. And we should be able to cover, yeah, we'll cover down through chapter 9 and verse 1. So if you want to look at that for next time, chapter 8, verse 27, down through chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 9 really belongs to chapter 8. That's, it's a bad chapter division there. So that's what we'll be looking at next time. I certainly appreciate your joining me. Uh, I appreciate your comments that uh, you give uh, uh, via either text message or on Facebook or uh, however you do that. And uh, I hope these lessons are an encouragement to you as they certainly are to me. And we'll see you next week.